Hello again, Lone Oak family. It's good to be back with you again today. And uh, today we're going to finish up our series that we've started on the on the Great Commission. We've we've gone through three weeks looking at the different things about being a disciple and and making a disciple in baptism. And this week we're going to be focusing on on teaching uh, and observing. And this all started. This all originated from the question we often ask ourselves: What's God's will for my life? What does God want me to do? Uh, beyond the generality, beyond the normal that all Christians should do. And what we, what we end up doing, uh, we end up pondering, contemplating this question, so much so that we neglect the things that we know we ought to do. And what, what I wanted to do with this series is encourage us to understand that God's Word reveals to us His will for our life. In this, in this Bible, in these scriptures, we will find what God wants us to do. Now, we will get different guidance on how to execute what God wants us to do, but to know the end state, to know the purpose, the finish line is important because that gives us a common point to direct our, our efforts towards. And so we, we started with that question and then we, we began to learn that it's God's desire that none should perish, but all should come to repentance, that all should come to a saving knowledge uh, with God's son, Jesus Christ. That's God's will. That's his desire. And then we learn that God's will for Jesus was to seek and save that which is lost. He was sent here to do that. And so Jesus' will was an extension of, of God's will, of God's desire. And as a result, Jesus gives us the Great Commission, which is the work I started, you need to keep doing. What, I have, what I've started doing, the will I've started to obey, it is now your job to obey it. This is the mission I give to you, to keep doing that which I started to do, to seek those that are lost and to present to them a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So that's our task. That's our, that's our goal. That's our mission. That's God's will for our life. So we need to be doing that. We need to be doing that in the best way we know how. We need to be constantly praying for those that are lost, praying for lost souls, praying for those in our community, as well as those outside of our community. Uh, pray for the interactions the opportunities. Pray for God to equip you, to help you. Pray for the Holy Spirit to take over in certain moments. And so all these things we've been, we've been looking at and we've been learning about and discussing. And so we're going to be uh, Matthew 28, 16 through 20. We'll read through it again and then we're going to go through uh, the last little bit that Jesus gives his disciples to do. So starting at verse 16. But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had de designated. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your Son. And thank you for the mission that you have given us to think uh, enough of us to include us in your plan and in your will. And Lord, I pray that we'd be obedient to this great commission, we'd be obedient to you in executing that which you have us uh, to do, the work that you have for us. And Lord, and help us to seek out uh, how to do that in a way that pleases you, Lord. We pray your spirit uh, be upon us now and help us and guide us and teach us. This we pray in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. So we started dissecting this with the understanding that in order to make disciples we first have to be a disciple and to be a disciple uh, composes several things it, it means to be available to have an attitude of worship and to be submissive to the authority of Jesus Christ and then we learned that that uh, the first part of all this of what we're supposed to be doing is going and making go therefore and make disciples of all nations so it's action-oriented. This is not something we can sit on the couch and accomplish. We have to be out there. We have to be active. We have to be involved in our communities. And then we looked at baptizing. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we looked at the doctrines of baptism and how baptism is the first step of obedience of a believer and how it's never too late to be baptized and it's never too early to understand what baptism means and to enter into that. And we looked at how we do that in the Trinity. In the name of the Trinity, we have the Godhead, three in one. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all three fully God, all three one God, and all three independent entities. And so we looked at these things, and then 
we understood the process of you make a disciple, then there's baptism. Then, in verse 20, Jesus tells them, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. So this is what we're going to look at this week is teaching. Teaching and observing. Don't forget observing. We often neglect the observing part. Uh, but we're instructed not just to teach people what Jesus commanded, but also how to observe what he commanded. And there's a difference between knowing right from wrong and doing right from wrong. So we're instructed to do both in the process of discipleship. And the same goes for before you can make a disciple, you have to be a disciple. In order for you to teach someone something, you first have to learn it yourself. And so it's not possible for me to teach someone uh, about a subject or a topic when I have no knowledge of it. And it's even harder for what I teach to have credibility when I don't live it. So that's where the importance of a disciple to know this word, to know scripture, and to live it out as best as we can is so important because when we come alongside someone that's a brand new believer and we try to teach them certain concepts, certain principles, when we don't live this thing out, it becomes confusing because we're telling them to do something that we ourselves aren't even doing. So what we preach and what we do must come together, must line up. And that's where the teaching and observing, that's why Jesus did not just mention one or the other. Okay, so what's important for them to know what to do, it's also important for them to know how to go about doing it. So that's what we've been called to do. We must become students of Christ, seeking to learn everything we can until we go home or until Christ returns. John 14, 23 through 26. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. So here we see Jesus and he says, if you really love me, if you want to call yourself a disciple and be true to it, you will keep my word. And my Father will love you and we will come and make our abode with you. But if you don't love me, you won't keep my word. And this is how you know. Those who genuinely love Jesus Christ and seek to serve and please him will do everything they can to obey him. They will seek to be obedient. Those who do not truly love Jesus Christ, those who just want to take on the title but not the responsibilities, they will not be obedient. They will make every excuse they can to not be obedient. They will say things like, well, I don't really agree with that, or the Bible doesn't really say it, or that's not how I interpret it. That's my favorite. That's not how I interpret it. Uh, we're going to talk about that here in a little later, but this, just so you know, there is a proper understanding, and everything else is irrelevant when it comes to Scripture. There's a right way to understand what was said and what was preached and what was taught and what was written down, and then everything else is an improper understanding. So how you interpret it doesn't matter unless you've interpreted it with a proper understanding. We must get a hold of this. And we see here that the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. Here we have again, the Trinity presents itself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we see the three different roles that they have, all fully God, all fully active, but they come in the name of Christ. It's the Father who sent the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is the one that teaches you all things and bring your remembrance, all that I said to you. So we know that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus Christ represents the Word. The Word is breathed by God. We're going to go over that here in a minute. And then the Holy Spirit's the one that teaches it to us. Another way to look at that is the Holy Spirit is the one that brings understanding. We know that in the scripture it says that uh, those who are not saved, those who are not believers, this book is foolishness to them. They can't understand it. it. It's folly. And the reason that is is because unless you are a truly believer and have the Holy Spirit living within you, none of this will make sense to you. None of this will line up. It's the Holy Spirit that brings about this understanding, just like it's the Holy Spirit that executes the spiritual gifts. It's the Holy Spirit that does these things. It's under his power, his wisdom, and his understanding that we are able to follow. And that's why you have to have uh, the Holy Spirit. You have to be saved. You have to have the salvation. Okay? And that's all the way back in the first step that we looked at. Making a disciple. You must be a disciple before these things can make sense to you. It would make no sense to try to teach them to observe the things that Jesus wants them to do before they're even a disciple. It just won't line up. 
So, the Word of God is compared to many symbols in the Bible. It's, uh, it's referred to as a pearl, as treasure, something that should be sought after and coveted. The Psalms tells us that the instructions of the Lord are perfect and more desirable than the finest gold. This is treasure, more valuable than anything here on earth. It's the greatest gift we've ever been given by God. And it's something that we are to continually search, continually dig at. Jesus compared it to a field. You go by a field, you find treasure. You go by a field and you dig for it, you search for it, you work at it. You seek all of it. You don't just get a little piece of it and say, I'm good, that's enough. This is a constant lifelong thing to be, to be diving into this word and learning it. And we should treat it as treasure. We are to possess it and to covet it as such. The word of God uh, is compared to milk for infants and bread or, or solid food for adults. This is spiritual nourishment. This is the fuel to help you grow and mature. Without this, you become a malnourished Christian. And, and we know physically malnourishment does not look good and it does not result in a healthy person. You must be uh, constantly digesting this word, constantly feeding yourself or being fed by uh, a good pastor and a good teacher this word because it's, it's what enables you to grow and mature as a Christian. Now, as a, as a new Christian, not physically, spiritually, as a new Christian, you, you gain the elementary principles. You gain the milk. And then as you grow and as you mature, you're ready to take on solid food. You're ready to take on more challenging concepts that all of a sudden they start to line up when you have all these other pieces, other foundations laid. You can start to build on that and gain, gain greater understanding. The Word of God is a seed. It's planted in the hearts of the believer. And if tended properly, it will grow and mature over time. Jesus did an entire parable. The sower and the seed. The seed was the Word. The soil is our heart. So we have to have a right heart for the seed to take root, to take place. And we don't get a new heart until we go through salvation. God says, I'll remove a heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. The word of God is a sword. Hebrews tells us that the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. In Ephesians, Paul lists this, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. It is the only offensive weapon listed in the armor of God. And the reason it's the only offensive weapon listed is because it's the only one you will ever need to do spiritual warfare, to do battle. If you look at every time Satan or the Pharisees or whoever it was opposed Jesus Christ, he fought back with the word. And all three instances were, were the temptations in the wilderness. Satan came against Jesus and Jesus responded with scripture. And that's all it took because this is powerful enough. When we talked about in Genesis and creation, God's word has the power to create, to bring order out of chaos, to bring life. The word still possesses that power today. All we have to do is proclaim it. Okay? The word of God is a lamp and a light. It reveals to us things that would cause us to stumble. It lights the path of the right way we are supposed to take. And when we stray from that path or when we stumble and fall it's our it's our lighthouse it's our beacon it's our way to get back to God to the path we're supposed to be on so the word of God is it's perfect it's infallible it's inerrant it does not possess any mistakes or errors and it cannot possess any mistakes or errors see the only thing that we have to understand is that there are human misunderstandings because this book came from an infinite mind from an infinite being. We are finite. We are limited in what we can understand, what we can comprehend. To give you an example, I can understand the concept of never ending. Something starts and then it goes on for eternity. I can get that. But to understand the concept that something never began, I cannot. Now, do I believe it? Yes, because God never began and he will never end. Scripture tells us this. But do I fully understand that? No. We talked about it last week with the Trinity, how all three are fully God and they come together to make one God and no one is above the other and they all have different roles or all different entities and personalities. Do I fully understand that? No. Do I fully believe it? Yes. And so this is where we have to get to a point where we acknowledge that a perfect God who created all that we have and all that we are, all that we can see and all that we do not see, 
He has the power to do all of that, but he made an error in the only book he ever wrote. And we as humans, flawed, found it. Or is it possible that God is perfect in what he wrote down and what he gave to us, and we as humans, from a flawed point of view, have misunderstood it? Which one of those sounds more reasonable? Which one of those is a more important stance to have when you approach God's word? See, we as humans, we, we tend to gain this mentality that we, we are capable of screwing up God's plans. We're capable of, of messing God's plans up to a point where they're, they're not fixable, they're not salvageable. We ourselves, I've heard people say, I'm too far gone. I've, I've done too much, I've sinned too much, there's just no, there's no saving me. And to those people who, who have this mentality, you need to understand something. You are not that powerful. You are not that wise. You are not that great. You are not greater than your creator. God knows all, sees all, and is all. And there's no way for you to get ahead of him. There's no way for you to trick him. There's no way for you to out-manipulate him or whatever you want to try to do. You can't do it. So why do we think that it's possible for us to mess up something when the grand creator, who knows everything, is... Here's another concept that baffles my mind. God is present in all tenses. God is present in all tenses. He's not just present here right now with us as, as I'm speaking these words. He is present in the future. He's present in the past. He's present in all tenses because to God there is no past, present, and future. He created time. Time's a concept for us, not for him. There's no way to get ahead of him. There's no way to mess him up. And same goes for his word. If God truly is powerful, and he is, and he's able to create everything we see and everything we don't see, and he did, then he can manage his own word. He can keep his own word. He can keep it in check. And that's not to say that we don't need to be diligent in how we treat this word and how we approach this word. It doesn't mean we can do whatever we want to this word. See, a lot of people think that humans interjected error when they transcribed it or uh, translated it or even when they wrote it down. But if they could do that, then is it really God's word to begin with? If they were capable of making these errors, then that would mean that it was human word. It was human written. And I can tell you right now, there's more evidence that supports that this thing is from God, from how many authors, how many books, and the time frame that it covers, for it to match up, to line up as perfectly as it does. Every single prophecy that has come to, to be true came from this book. It hasn't missed one of them yet. And I believe there's a whole book at the end that's chock full of them that we haven't even begun to see yet. So we, we have to understand that we are not more powerful than our creator. And God is fully capable of maintaining his word regardless of what we do. But we still should be diligent in how we, how we approach this word and how we treat this word. And we can't afford to teach and observe only things that, that we like or we agree with. It says to teach and observe all that Jesus commanded. Some people want to either take scripture out of context or manipulate it, or they neglect certain scriptures that bring clarity. Um, if you take certain scripture out of context, the argument could be made that Moses was a great tennis player because it says that he served in Pharaoh's courts with praise. You take it out of context, you, you could easily make that argument, but when you put it into context, you understand that's not what went on. So there's a proper, uh, they call it hermeneutics. It's a proper way to approach the study of God's word, to look at the context, to look at the background. Who is speaking? Who are they speaking to? And what this does, it, for us, it creates a picture of the, of the day in which what was being said or what was being written occurred. What were the issues? What were the struggles? And then we can look at, okay, that was then. How is that applicable to us today? You know, back then they didn't have cell phones, they didn't have cars, they didn't have things like that. But that doesn't mean they didn't struggle with sin. They didn't have temptation. They didn't have Satan trying to trip them up because they did. So we've got to find it. We've got to search for that. How do we bring that into modern day, into our life and apply it? That's the point of study. It's not there like a buffet to pick and choose what you like and skip over what you don't. It all applies. It's all applicable. But a proper interpretation, a proper understanding 
of this word is crucial, not only for us to apply it and to observe it, but to teach it as well. Jesus didn't, didn't teach or instruct us to do these things just to please him or amuse him. He gave us his word so that we can be blessed and have a life of joyful obedience in him. A disciple, by definition, is a learner and a follower. And this is just like the gift of evangelism. Some of you may say, well, I don't have the gift of teaching. That does not mean that you are not called to teach. Every parent's been called to teach their child these things. But just because you don't have that gift doesn't mean that you don't teach. It means that you have to learn how to teach these things. And those that have the gift of teaching, it's their job to to instruct the church, to edify the church on how to instruct these things, how to pass this information along. Listen, no one's saying you have to take on a class of 50 people, 100 people, or even 10 people. But when you come alongside and try to accomplish this great commission, part of it is teaching. So you need to learn how to do that. And this can be a one-on-one thing. You can find a whole lot more depth and in conversation and a one-on-one interaction with somebody. But teaching and observing is part of this. So that means that you, regardless if you've been given this gift or not, need to learn how to teach. And the other flip side of that coin that we learned in evangelism is it's the gift of the Holy Spirit, not the gift of a certain individual. You do not possess this gift as your gift, but you possess it because the Holy Spirit that resides within you has ownership of it and can execute it at any time he sees fit. Edification or to edify is to instruct or to improve a person morally or intellectually. That's what these gifts are for, the edification of the church. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. That word inspired means God breathed. It doesn't mean that God just influenced things to be written. It doesn't mean that, hey, it would sound a lot better if you wrote that psalm this way, because see, those things rhyme, so that makes it sound cooler. Yeah, say a deer panted for the water. Don't, don't say he was thirsty. Say he panted for the water. That sounds a lot better. No. This comes from God. It's God's own this. This is his word from his mouth. He breathed it. And then those that were faithful wrote it down. And Jesus didn't want us to teach and learn to do these things just because. The purpose behind the teaching and the learning is so that we can be equipped for every good work. It's for equipping us. So you cannot please or serve God if you don't know what it means to please or serve him. We talked about, in Samuel, we talked about Saul and how he was ordered by God to slaughter, to kill, to destroy everything that belonged to the Amalekites. But he didn't. He took, he took some of the prized oxen and sheep and animals and livestock, and then he brought them back. And when Samuel confronted him, he said, well, I'm going I'm to take these and sacrifice them to your God. Because he, he could put together the pieces that sacrifice was a thing people did, but he missed the whole point of pleasing God. And the way we please God is to obey his word, not to go rogue and do what we think he would like. Saul gave us a great picture of that. We, we, we must seek to please him and to serve him the way he tells us to, the way he instructs us to, not the way we think he would like, or not the way we, we want to. No one is a true disciple apart from personal faith in Jesus Christ, and there is no true disciple apart from an obedient heart that desires to please the Lord in all things. Romans six seventeen. but thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. We've got to get back to where we properly handle this word and we properly teach this word. And we cannot be shy about anything in this word. If it's in here, we must teach it. And that goes for who do we support? What do we not support? Sanctity of life, the sovereignty of God, his chosen people in the nation of Israel, marriage between one man and one woman. It is a covenant decreed by God. It is not something the government issues. It does not belong to the government. Marriage belongs to God. And he gave us one way to accomplish this. 
We cannot shy away from these things just because the world will say that they're condemning or they're judgmental. No, they're not. And if they are, then that judgment comes from God, not from us. We don't say these things in a condemning or judging way. We teach these things because they are things that God has given us to teach and to learn and to observe. See, the world rebels against the word of God. And they'll even twist it to a point where it becomes okay or even legal or even preferred. And to go against that is, is to condemn. And that's, and that's where we have to stand our ground. Does the book say this? Yes. Then we teach it and we observe it. We've got to get back to that. We've got to start doing that. Jesus ends the Great Commission with the statement, And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Without this last part, we would not be able to accomplish the Great Commission. Neither the attitudes of availability, worship, and submission, nor faithful obedience to God's word would be possible apart from Christ's own power working in and through us. It is not us that's able to execute these things. It's not our power or our understanding that accomplishes God's will. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit that we're able to walk in the ways of the Lord and to be obedient disciples. We must continually rely on the power of Jesus Christ for every step we take in this life. And the work is not done until you've breathed your last breath or we are called up to be with Jesus Christ. Until one of those two things happen, the Great Commission is your mission. It's our mission. We as individuals and we as a body have been commissioned by Jesus Christ to execute these things. And no one said you had to do this alone. It's, a, it's actually a much better task to do it alongside someone else. But the best part about this is Jesus is going to be with you no matter where you go, no matter where you serve, no matter who you minister to, he's there. He's there and he's with you and he will give you what you need and equip you for every good work. So it's time we as a church begin to lay down our excuses, to lay down our misunderstandings, our personal opinions, and even in some cases we need to set aside our emotions. And get back to a point where we seek to be obedient and to serve Jesus Christ the way he called us to. To go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all that he commanded us to do. This is what we should be found doing when Jesus comes to get us. Our work is not finished until Jesus says it is. So us as a church... In a community, I would love to see us come together and find ways to be active. I will say this, Lone Oak does a great job of finding numerous opportunities to get plugged in. We, we, we've sent people overseas on missions. We've sent people across borders internationally. We've sent people to Kentucky. We've got people that minister in their own backyard. We have parents teaching their kids these things. We have young ones being baptized. I'm not saying that Lone Oak is not accomplishing this great commission. What I am saying is don't slow down. Matter of fact, speed it up. Reach out farther. Stretch yourself farther. Step out of your comfort zone a little more. And don't do it alone. Bring somebody alongside you, someone you can trust, someone you can practice with and rehearse with. But we've got to start stepping out more because there's still lost people in this community. There's still lost souls that are within arm's reach right now. And I don't want to get to heaven and see them and think I never said a word. I had opportunity after opportunity to share the gospel with them and I chickened out. I became shy or I made every other excuse. That's not where you want to be. That's not where they want to be either. So I love Lone Oak. I love this church family. I love what we do. And it is my prayer and my challenge that we keep doing it. But we improve in it. We grow in it. This is something that we can tend to and we can nurture. And it becomes this great 
great light that Lone Oak has become in this community as a place where those who are lost can come and be saved. To come and hear the gospel, to come and find what Jesus has been calling them to do. Father God, thank you so much for your word, for this mission, and for these past four weeks and really diving into what it is you've called us to do, your will for our life. And Lord, I pray that you would continually reveal these things to us, reveal to us what you want us to do, where you want us to go, and who you want us to minister to. Lord, we pray for those that are lost in this community, those lost souls that do not know you. Lord, may we preach and live the gospel of Jesus Christ to those people at all times. Lord, we pray for the interactions that you're going to bring to us, the chance to minister to these lost souls. Lord, we pray for their hearts, that they would be receptive of the gospel. But even if they're not, Lord, pray that we'd be obedient to you and sharing it with them in its totality, in its fullness, everything about your son, the blood that covers our sins, the resurrection, the fact that you brought them back from the dead. Help us to proclaim that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that you raised him from the dead, that we will be saved. Lord, help us to be bold in sharing these things and sharing these biblical truths and to live them out. May you use us to further your kingdom, God. This is what we desire as your disciples. We pray this in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen.